All right, I am so excited uh, that we are about to launch into discussing this normative case study, Seeing Green, uh, written by Allison Stevens, who's currently a doctoral student at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, to discuss this case, we have four outstanding guests. Um, Shirley Edwards is a longtime friend to this podcast and a member of the board of Ethics and Education Network. Throughout her life and career, which has taken her from Kentucky to New York City to Virginia, she's been a parent coordinator, a teacher, a principal, and an early childhood consultant. She was founding principal of EBS High School for Public Service, which is a public high school in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Our second guest, Tina Grotzer, is a colleague of mine. She's a cognitive and learning scientist at the Harvard Graduate School of Education where her most recent course offering this fall is, is teaching climate change. And I should say personally that um, she is a really cherished colleague on the faculty and I send every single one of my learning and teaching uh, advisees to her classes um, and try to oversubscribe them every single spring. Randy Curran is another longtime friend. I've known him since I was a graduate student. Um, Back in the day, uh, he's a philosopher of education and co-chair of the philosophy department at the University of Rochester. He's written numerous publications, really wonderful books and, co and edited books, including his 2017 book, Living Well Now and in the Future, Why Sustainability Matters. And then our fourth guest is uh, Sadie Sunda who is a sophomore at the University of Idaho, where she's double majoring in civil engineering and in environmental science. She's an active member of the Student Sustainability Club, and she hopes to work in sustainability as an environmental engineer. So welcome, uh, Shirley, Tina, Randy, and Sadie. I am so excited to have you here um, to talk about this case, Seeing Green, uh, with me. So uh, to get us started, um, I'm just, Curious, Tina, do you mind kicking us off to uh, talk to us a little bit about when you read this case, what did you see as being some of the dilemmas in this case? And for whom are they dilemmas? Sure. As I think about this case, I can see why Miss McGuire, as a beginning teacher, would see this as squarely in her court, something she has to deal with. Um, she's responsible for teaching the science. The next generation science standards um, in middle school talk about human effects of climate change and particularly linked to the fossil fuel um, industry. And so, you know, it feels like it's hers to deal with. In high school, the, the standards don't focus on human effects so much. They really are focusing on the science. However, when I think about this case, I think that it's actually a dilemma that the entire school has to take a look at. And part of that um, reasoning comes from the research that shows that unless students understand that they can take action, unless they're empowered to take action and realize that they can make a change in the world, that they are, um, they really are the ones whose laps this whole problem is falling into. So, um, if the school takes that into account, then it becomes really clear that this is not just about teaching science in a science class. This is about teaching the kinds of actions, the things that we can do, you know, as humans in a human society to make a big difference in the world and to, to save the planet, quite honestly. And so uh, I think there are a variety of perspectives to bring to bear on the problem and that this is really a dilemma the school faces in terms of the kinds of conversations that they need to have and the resources they need to bring to bear, um, you know, more interdisciplinary resources. You can't, you can't just send, you know, young people out with the weight of the problem without also offering them of path towards solutions. Just um, really, we see you know higher rates of depression. We see kids backing down, thinking there's nothing they can do. Uh, the mental health issues are just too big. So I would agree with Tina. I think it's a it's a dilemma for all. Uh, where I think uh, the the thing that comes up for me as I look at this dilemma, it's also a dilemma for how you bring parents and community into this conversation. 
when they really listen to their children and oftentimes do not understand standards and how they apply to the school and what it means to science and also the politics. Uh, you know, I felt like that uh, politics was definitely into it in as much as that most of the parents seem to have been working in a uh, in one of the, of the places where they have talk about uh, energy. And I think that uh, obviously they wanted their children to be outspoken. They wanted their children to have a point of view, but uh, it didn't seem that they understood exactly what the teacher was doing. The other part is that is the role of the principal and those persons that support the teacher, which makes the teacher feel like that she is definitely is in her that she has to make that choice, and without the support that she did not get. So I think that one of the things that I look at is that this is, as Tina said, this is for all of them. This is a big conversation, but it's also a conversation about values. How do we help people clarify their values and how do we take them into consideration when we're having a discussion? So, I mean, that's what I saw. It was a really, really interesting. I felt uh, uh, you want to have the kind of teacher that Ms. McGuire is. You really do want to have that teacher who really wants to do the right thing by what she's teaching, but she also gave alternatives. And that's something that I think we have to talk about is what are the alternatives when we make these choice, we have these choices that best move us forward. I think the largest thing that I noticed was the immense amount of pressure on everyone in the situation. The, of course, the teacher not really knowing what to do and having um, all these people kind of looking towards her, but in reality, it's kind of the entire school. And then uh, the, a lot of the things that I was seeing was within the classroom, seeing these students fighting with each other, and now they have pressure on them from their parents and not exactly knowing what they're supposed to believe, because I think a lot of it was people putting their position on others. There was the school and the, and the um, parents talking to the teacher about these things that aren't exactly in her control, um, but having to make the decisions. I think that having the the teacher not exactly knowing what position she's supposed to take and the parents oppose, like opposing it in the way that they are, I think that there needs to be a lot of boundaries put between the parents and the faculty at the school. I think I, I'd just like to add a couple of things. I mean, I think I think when you're in positions of leadership, you have to figure out what you can do immediately and what you have to step back from and, and approach in a more deliberative and sustained way. And so where the case ends, I think you've you've had a, a sort of rush to endorse a, a, a sort of ill-defined compromise. I think the fact that that compromise is ill-defined leaves them all with some dilemmas about how to um, think through what they really need to do. And I think that on, on the very close-up side of it is you've got students and parents who seem to have, uh, seem to be in a, a state of denial. Uh, there are different ways to define that, but You've got, you've got a town in peril, frankly. It is at present critically dependent on the, on the uh, gas and oil industry. Uh, families dependent on it. That's, that's an undeniable reality that has to be recognized in how to go forward. You've got parents and students who are not ready to fully accept the science. So you've got dilemmas about how to productively educate in that setting. Um, the parents have said, uh, you know, you need to stay away from policy and you need to let give students the evidence and let them judge for themselves. There are things right and wrong in that. So I think one, one, one very specific dilemma is how do you separate the science and the policy? What are the things that you can properly leave to students to try to debate as open questions? Uh, not the science, um, but things about the future of the town. Um, how do you respond to 
the community values and perceptions of the parents. You can't give all of their beliefs a free pass. But how to how to productively deal with the errors uh, in in that context is is very challenging. So, um, I mean, one sense I have reading it is schools are in a position of educating students and indirectly uh, possibly educating their parents. And the school plays a very critical role in the community. So how how do you how does the school play that role in in sort of leading the community, leading the students in it first and foremost, but maybe the community more broadly into an acceptable future. There's a lot there that the town has to figure out, um, not just the students. And figuring out how to teach in that situation is very, very challenging. I would agree with the fact that this is a larger conversation, Randall. I do, and Tina. What I do concerned about is bringing all these together. How do you have this conversation? You can't always have it at school. I think you have to have it and have it in, in different types of places. And that's what happened in my experience. We didn't have this this just in our school. We had it at the churches. We had it at uh, community centers. We had it on one-on-ones. And of course, what happened is, is that when people came to about, when P teachers applied for our schools, they knew what to expect. And I think the level of expectations is real important. And I think with Ms. McGuire, the thing that concerns me is that she really didn't know what she was being put into when she had the meeting with the parents. So, you know, there was that opposition and the pressure that I think oftentimes teachers feel and why they don't stay in our schools. So um, um, everybody needs to be heard and everybody needs to be understood. And I think that's, you know, a really important starting place. One of the the uh, activities that I sometimes do with my own students when they're in a puzzle like this is an activity that comes from work many years ago called Moral Musical Chairs. And what it means is that there's, but in this case, instead of there being one missing chair, everyone has a chair in Moral Musical Chairs. But the first thing I ask my students to think about is, Who's missing? Who else should have a seat at the table? Who are the non-obvious players here? Perhaps it's someone on the other side of the world who's impacted by climate change, who's you know getting pushed out of their own community. Whereas here we have a community where you know people are um, thriving in the oil and gas industry, and clearly those things are going to change. <laughs> um, but they're you know I, I would guess, but. Um, so, so the first question I would really start to ask is about who, whose perspective needs to be at the table and engaging the students in that. Um, and I think the question also about separating the science from the policy is, is an important one. There are a lot of ways to address the science here. Uh, you know, we, we teach students to think about claims, evidence, and reasoning, and we ask them to, to evaluate claims through that way in science. Science is certainly not in the position of shutting down dissent. So, you know, when Mason steps forward and says, this has happened before, well, Mason's actually right. So, you know, longitudinally, if you look at climate change over time, we have had periods in our history where carbon has gone up. It's also been followed by ice ages. So that might be a, a useful thing for, you know, the class to start to explore, but first sort of honoring that knowledge that people are bringing to the table. Um, and I think one other thing I would say about the science is that, you know, as teachers, as much as we, you know, want to be able to invest in students and we hope that we'll be able to change their minds, I would separate that in, in a, a couple of ways for Ms. McGuire. I think, you know, if she helps her students think about what's sensible, what do I understand? What is the, you know, sort of helping them understand the science? And then there's the question of what's a plausible explanation? How do I start to explain this? And ex do I accept this as a possible explanation for what's going on with climate change? And then there's the final sort of part, which is about believability. Do you actually believe it? And in my own experiences working with eighth graders, we've spent time sort of parsing out, you know, okay, so that makes sense to me. And I can even see where it would be a possible explanation, they would say, but I don't believe it. 
you know, and that's their prerogative. But as a science teacher, I would certainly want them to understand the concepts and I would certainly want them to um, see them as plausible in terms of being an explanation. It's interesting what you're doing is actually raising another um, dilemma in ways for the students um, of, right, whom whom should they entrust authority as a, uh, into and how much uh, uh, should we just place trust in scientific authorities? Um, uh, Tina and I have a colleague, Paul Harris, who uh, does work exactly in this area of thinking about how much trust we actually, uh, that children sort of have to place in adult authorities. Um, and Lindsay, I think, in the case is bringing this up, right, where uh, she's, uh, where Mason is questioning the video that they're watching, saying all those numbers come from the EPA, in case you haven't heard, Shandell, the EPA has been filled with liberals for years. Abby says, Mason, you can't call science political just because you don't like it. And then Lindsay says, yeah, but you shouldn't be defending the video just because it does agree with your politics, right? Basically, sh they're having a conversation uh, about on whose authority should you know, can they rest this? And are they, in fact, in a position to judge scientifically? I'm curious, Sadie, you are the closest of any of us to being a science learner. You are currently in a position of learning science. Uh, you are the closest to being a high schooler. Can you talk to us a little bit about your experience as a student, both being asked to think scientifically and do science, and at the same time, uh, you know, still being a comparative novice, although clearly way more developed than I am. <laughs> It's definitely difficult. I remember being, growing up in Idaho, we actually, there was a point where it wasn't even allowed to, be, te to teach um, human influenced climate change at all. It was completely stripped from our policies and then it was actually added back at the end of, of high school. But it, it, I come from a community that really um, um, does not exactly support climate change at all. And it was very difficult to um, go through classrooms where there was a lot of opposition and a debate within what we were teaching. I had um, a couple of teachers that completely disregarded climate change and told us that we shouldn't believe in it. I had a couple that were supportive. And so it was really up to the students to individually decide what they felt, which was not exactly ideal. I think it was really difficult to have that amount of pressure to say that you need to be completely in charge of what you want to learn and that it's not going to be taught and it's going to be ignored. And then at the end of high school, although we did learn some of the science, uh, it was still, you could definitely tell that it was something that the teachers were really hesitant about. And I wish that it was a little bit um, more, like there was more of a standard as what we were learning but I think coming from an area where a lot of the parents, I would not want to be just them to have like a large authority over what we were learning. I think it is more up to the people that have a better understanding of education and climate change to tell what the curriculum should be like in schools. You know, so I study the cognitive science of how people reason about the complexity in climate change. And, you know, for many of us, it's something that is difficult to understand. You know, when I was a kid in the 1960s, I could look out and see pollution in the sky and I would believe that we needed to do something. It's really hard to look out and say, oh, carbon, I can't see it. I don't know it's there. It's why understanding the mechanism becomes so important. But at the same time, there are so many complex ideas related to climate change that to truly understand and believe it is a feat that many teachers, you know, haven't accomplished. And so, you know, asking students to is a, is a real challenge. It's it's an area that where we need a lot of um, really careful thought. I don't know that we're there yet, but we need to get there. <laughs> uh, Tina, what you just said makes sense. What I wanted to go back is to Randall is that when I looked at this case and I heard what the parents compromise was, uh, I was concerned that parents uh, were seemingly able to make decisions about what the teacher was supposed to do. And it was almost like it was left that way. And there was never an issue about policy. There was never any explanation. 
So when we talk about the whole process of getting everyone involved, I think that there's ways in which the the uh, <clears throat> the leadership has to be able to talk with the parents in ways in which they don't feel that they're they have the last word. And in this case, I kind of felt like that uh, the compromise that they were giving was just didn't make much sense to the process and to the uh, to what they were talking about. What's striking to me in this conversation is that uh, we can go really productively down one of these dilemmas and develop really exciting, valuable, complex thinking about that dilemma, right? So uh, this, say, this question about how do we teach science well, particularly climate science, where it under, requires students to develop kinds of complex thinking, uh, understandings of com complex causation, which, uh, as you pointed out, uh, both Tina uh, and Randy, are hard for adults, including adult scientists, with you know um, knowledge in the field, really to. Um, uh, grab hold of and understand and and how and how do we also teach things like uh, the uncertainty of science and the way and sort of the scientific epistemology and then as Sadie says you know there are these dilemmas for the students about learning science whom do I trust and why do I trust and how much authority do I feel I should have as a student versus how much do I want to place it in the hands of others and what do I do when I see that my own teachers are a little unsure about what they're teaching or when I hear something different at home from what I hear from my teachers from what I hear from my peers and how do I navigate those spaces and that's all really really important in the domain of teaching and learning science. But to go back to so many of the other dilemmas that you guys brought up, that's only one of these dilemmas, right? How do we think about um, teaching and learning science when the science itself is uh, politically contested? That's a really, really important ethical dilemma. But you guys also brought up a bunch of others, right? Um, there's the sticking with the science of it. There was the one that Tina brought up uh, where she said, this isn't about Ms. McGuire. This is about the entire school, right? Who is responsible for teaching uh, not just climate science, but really about existential threat? and about empowering students then to um, address existential threat and feel empowered to make existential change, essentially. And how do we think about um, what it means then to support students gaining agency, and then how we support students mentally uh, for placing that agency on them, right? And we've, you know, I think probably all of us have seen uh, Greta Thunberg expressing profound anger at having this kind of responsibility be placed on her and other teenagers, right? That also feels like a really rich set of ethical dilemmas. You know, how much responsibility should we be placing on students? to address uh, the challenges that they haven't created and you know who should feel responsible for that in the school. And that's really, really different from another set of dilemmas that you all brought up, um, which uh, say, you know, Randy, I think articulated really clearly is that this just isn't about, you know, who should be responsible for addressing this uh, within the school. This is about an entire community needing to come to terms with who they are and what kind of existential threat they face and what they want to become as a community. How do they decide collectively what it means to survive as a community? To what extent is this about their values? To what extent is this about their current economy? To what extent is this about their current environment and climate and their, you know, how they engage in land use and so forth? How do they how do they collectively think about a way forward and what would mean still uh, for, you know, the whole community surrounding Maple Rivers High School to, uh, to be a strong collective community in the face of inexorable change? That 
is really different from the questions that uh, I think Shirley was really leading us down of thinking about, you know, what are the guardrails that should be set up by whom uh, among different stakeholders? And Tina brought up stakeholders as well, you know, all of you have, right? There are a whole bunch of other things that you guys <laughs> brought up as well. That wasn't, you know, a summary of everything. But I want to point out that we did a really beautiful job of like going down one of these issues and we have these others that are still like out here. Uh, Tina, go for it. So one of the things that um, I think is so um, important about this particular dilemma is that it extends so much beyond the community, that it truly is an existential crisis that human beings, the, that humans are facing. Um, bacteria, you know, other things, they'll be fine, I believe. I don't, you know, I don't know. But, but for humans, this is an existential crisis. And, you know, we're all in the same boat. And yet we're not talking with each other. We are, you know, it's about finding common ground to have those conversations. But the highest ideals have to do with the continuance of the human species, you know, for, and, and every other, you know, beautiful organism on this planet of, you know, those which we are wiping out at a terrible um terrible rate. I know I've been expanding sort of like what, what I want to include in this dilemma, but I think the voices are far beyond us. And I think that they include, you know, even those other organisms that, you know, we are responsible for protecting. Yeah. So in this case, uh, Tina, I agree with you. I agree with Randall. However, bringing those voices in this particular case, as at the very end, when the parents were making their recommendations and the students had already uh, explored how they wanted to be seen and what they thought about the science, I still think this was a great opportunity. So when we talk about bringing them in they, and who would have done that, they would have been greatly done by the principal had she had that sense of awareness. So when Randall, when you talk about the whole idea of bringing community together, there's got to be somewhere where it becomes part of the conversation to the point that people see it as important to their livelihood. Because definitely in this case, it was about their life. These parents were talking about what they wanted their children to be able to do when they graduated. They might have to get the same job, but they wanted them to know that they had played a tremendous role in taking care of them and also make keeping them safe and healthy. And whatever they were being taught, it was important because they made it clear that they wanted to keep the science. They weren't willing to agree with it all, but they were willing to keep it. So that conversation of opening it up, which I've seen done, but it can't be done sometimes just totally if the school is isolated from the community. Right. I mean, I think I think you've both uh, pointed to the need to create co conversational spaces that are sufficiently inclusive. Um, and my experience teaching environmental justice since shortly after Hurricane Katrina and teaching some of the research on the psychosocial dynamics of denial is that you have to give people conversational spaces where they can move pretty quickly towards action. It depends on what the setting is. There are little cases that could be a little different from this, where the conversations are very hard, but you, you, if you have the different players involved and you have a, a setting where people can, people can grapple with the troubling emotions and move towards some action, it's absolutely critical. That I think the evidence is once people realize there's a problem and they become troubled by it, right? They become very fearful. They experience guilt and shame and intense anxiety. And if you don't move them towards sustaining conversations, moving towards constructive action, they shut it down. They, they stop thinking about it. I've lost so many students you know, in the course of a semester where they shut down and they wouldn't let it in anymore versus the ones where I got emails from them at two o'clock in the morning 
And they said, wow, I'm, this is keeping me awake. What do I do? I have a list of things they can do. I will send to them, right? Um, it's changed over the years, but that's a fundamental dynamic of this is that you've, you've, you cannot, I mean, this goes to the activism versus science. If you're teaching the science and it's troubling, there are lines you, maybe you can't cross of being an activist yourself on policy, but you have to be prepared to engage students in a way where they can find a way forward or they will not be able to keep learning and dealing constructively with what you're trying to teach them. We've named, I think, some pretty fundamental values here that what I'm hearing also can come into conflict. One value is existential survival, particularly of human beings and other, uh, not just charismatic megafauna, but um, you know, fauna period and many flora, right? Um, many of us living on earth who are earthlings. A second uh, is democracy. This, va th this value of democratic engagement, uh, uh, exercising collective voice, bringing in voices, figuring out whose voices to include and how and why and so forth. Uh, a third value uh, is um, present day survival, including economic survival, protecting our livelihoods, right? Uh, and then this fourth va value is actually the present day value of protecting our psyches um, and uh, feeling capable of um, actually taking action and not just shrinking into total shame, guilt, withdrawal, and the shutting down. And these values of mental health and well-being, of economic health and survival, of democratic engagement and respect for multiple voices, and of existential survival, they all seem like valuable values, but they are coming into present day conflict. Randy, go for it. And then I do want to turn to Sadie to hear how she thinks about navigating these. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, just, I just want to add, I mean, I think another extremely important value is integrity in teaching your subject. And that involves presenting and being, being a, a, a spokesperson for the value of your subject and honesty in in introducing students to it and how it works but also being mindful of the boundaries of your of the expertise of those within your subject and so i I, mean, I think integrity in teaching is absolutely central value here too um well i think the largest um dilemma that came to mind for me is the existential crisis and I think we're largely underestimating what young people can understand, especially in uh, the time we are in today with a 24 hour news cycle and having to do school shooting practices in school and having a lot of other large issues that even as a young child, you start to understand a little bit. And I think one of the biggest things that would help make things less political is to just have like a genuine connection to our earth. And I think that that's something that is not exactly represented in our schools. We get this pressure, especially in my generation, that we are the ones that are going to change the world and stop climate change. But at the same time, it's either not taught in schools or it's just a couple of weeks at the end of high school instead of it being a larger thing that is taught in school. Um, I did a little bit of uh, teaching with elementary school students and just talking about the environmental issues in my community. And I think we really underestimate what we can learn even from a young age and just having that connection and the genuine want and desire to help not only our community, but to help others is something that I don't think is taught enough in schools. So I think having that perspective where you understand the science, but you also do want to change and help what is going on is 
something that I think needs to be added to the curriculum throughout, not only in high school, but in middle school and down to elementary school as well. That resonates with um, what a lot of the research shows in preschool programs, that when kids learn really early to care for the earth, to feel a connection to it, that they continue to grow in those ways. And um, particularly in the classrooms of teachers who have those kinds of connections, there are really nice examples where people have reached across their differences to think about what's the common principle, the common value that we hold. So there was an example, um, it was a number of years back now, but um, Richard Civic, a fundamental um, conservative uh, minister, I believe, um, and uh, Eric Chivian, scientist at, at Harvard, who was head of the um, Center for uh, uh, global climate education. Well, it was it was a center for health and the global environment. They, you know, had very different ideas about what was causing climate change. But what they decided was that they needed to come together because they care about planet Earth. So they created a whole program around creation care. And, you know, I think they got maybe it was in 2008 Time magazine gave them an award for, you know, one of the most influential you know, people. But I, I think as a model, that's inspiring because even if, you know, Richard didn't agree that it was human caused uh, causes that the, the um, climate change was occurring because of our actions, he agreed that the planets, that this is a beautiful gift that we have here in this precious planet Earth. And so, you know, and then for Eric to be able to say, this is this is our point of intersection and be able to run with that and think about what we can do in terms of action to Randall's point at that, that you know, juncture of agreement. Thank you, Tina. So you've actually moved us directly into uh, where I was hoping we'd go next, which is, you know, thinking about these characters, what should they do in the here and now? Shirley, can you start well, us off? What I, what I thought is that when I, Miss McGuire, when she talked about the fact that when they didn't agree or when they had the, uh, wanted to explain their positions, uh, she immediately thought about what she could do to make it better or to make it clearer. Her, her real goal was to be true to what it is she thought she was supposed to be teaching. And she was teaching with the curriculum as she knew it to be the one that she's supposed to. But then again, here are, this is where you have three groups of people who are in disagreement in some ways about something, some part of it, not everything. That could start a conversation had you had the principal understand her role. Because she would be the person otherwise, uh, that I think would be the person to start it. However, her issue, she was afraid of what the parents would say. So she kind of let the ball drop. But this is not just for the school, but this is something that should be shared with her superintendency so that she can see, so that she could bring it to a wider audience. Because it's just not these parents that are having the issues. There are probably other issues that their parents are having issues with. So who starts this? It starts from where it began. That's where, you know, and you you make some compromises, but everybody in this situation has a could be part of a win. That's what I feel. So the so, win so, yeah. so can I ask actually really specifically? Um so Mrs. Lee, the principal, um has this fairly young, fairly new teacher yes. who's popular, um, but is facing this pushback. Are you suggesting that this teacher uh, take this dispute sort of more public and, and stand up for sort of the science of climate change or have a public discussion with these skeptical parents <laughs> even beyond the, you know, her, her office? That's I don't get, dangerous for Ms. McGuire. Well, let me just say this to you. I don't get that Mr. McGuire, Ms. McGuire is ready to take that on. Right, However, yeah, so I'm a little worried for her. But the, uh -huh. yeah, I'm, yeah, because she really is afraid for her job, and her job is at stake. She's feeling that. But the yeah. other part is that she has two people that are supporting her. Mm -hmm. That was Miss Ruiz and Mr. Fox, mm -hmm. and they could be her. She could speak to them in terms of her dilemma, because her dilemma is: what does she do? Do I just give in? Because she's 
And what is what uh, uh, Randall talked about is that you get a sense of her integrity. That's what I got a sense of is the fact that she felt that she was doing what she's supposed to do, and she didn't want to compromise on it. There got to be other teachers teaching science in mm -hmm. that building. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, I mean, I I don't know no other way that uh, you know this is where you begin to lobby somewhere. You know, you use all, and because this is also political, but it's also in, uh, economical because the other part of this is that people, livelihood is tied to this and they want their children to believe that they're doing good work mm -hmm. and that they're not mm -hmm. being damned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you have such a beautiful description of this case. I have to say my own internal anxiety is rising again because I'm, because it take it's taking me back to this dilemma. I, like you're right. I think that Miss Ruiz thinks that she's a supporter of uh, Miss McGuire, and yet she's saying, "Well, there's a difference between science and activism." And I know you can connect school and community. And I'm thinking of Miss as Miss McGuire. Oh my gosh! Now what am I supposed to do? Yeah, but the but, point yeah. is that this is a person who is the, the curriculum. She is. How does that happen? This happens in our schools. <laughs> Where we have people who are in charge of teaching and teachers, and Miss McGuire obviously came prepared to teach this subject. Yeah. So, I mean, so Mr. Fox has said, "You're gonna, you're gonna keep teaching all the science. That's fine, right? Uh, but you know, there's a difference between the science and policy and activism. If she sleeps on it, she, she, she doesn't have to change the curriculum." to satisfy the terms of this kind of vaguely defined compromise, right? So uh, she should keep teaching the science. I think the issue for her is how she, without changing the curriculum, engages the students. And it seems to me, you might not like this because maybe it's denying it's as hard a dilemma as you're trying to set up to be, but, but she's very good at engaging the students in um, taking what they're getting in the curriculum into the community. She needs to, she needs to frame in a properly conditional way what the scientific consensus is on getting off of fossil fuels. What the scientists can and do say is, well, if we want to avert the worst effects of climate change, we're going to have to get ourselves off of fossil fuels. That's a scientific consensus. Saying what we should do beyond that more specifically, she, sh she ought to be putting that to the students. Uh, here our community depends on fossil fuels in these ways um, and so on. Here's the setting of our town that we all live in. We all want it to prosper and have a long, healthy future. So put them to work, right, in thinking through what to do with this scientific finding that fossil fuels are a huge driver of anthropogenic climate change. Another approach for her would be to help the students understand what's necessary to have a habitable planet. So what has to happen on planet Earth? Because planet Earth is remarkably unique and amazing, you know, in, in the point in which we are living in time that we have this sort of balanced radiation budget that allows it, you know, you need some greenhouse gases to have it be warm enough for us to be comfortable on the planet and not be, you know, in a block of ice. And then, but you need not too much so that we don't, you know, start to block out um, incoming radiation. So, you know, to focus on some of the science that makes Earth this unique and precious commodity, right? if you're going to, well, I don't like commoditizing planet Earth, but, um, you know, if you think about, and then you think about also sources of greenhouse gases, it's not just the fossil fuel industry. So methane, you know, cows are the new coal, um, coal, um, issues of the concrete industry. There are lots of different sources. Um, and to start to look at the variety of sources that, you know, it's not just their town, it's not just the focus of their town. Um, and to start to see it in this larger picture, that might also be helpful. I found in general that the whole thing was a little inappropriate to have the, the teacher there and the principal and the the parents, which I know we can all agree on that the way that it, that it was set up was just the principal should have probably stepped in. 
Uh, and I understand that, you know, these, these are people that rely on fossil fuels and they also don't want their children demonizing them for their livelihood and they don't want their kids to hate what they do. But I think it largely just comes back to the classroom and it, it seems in this situation that this is some of the kids first um, time really understanding climate change and it's probably just, oh, everything's not going well and they're probably very, very concerned and that's why it's coming back to the parents. But I, I would definitely agree with Randy that the, the doubling down on the actual science and just adding more levels of communication within the classroom and between the school board and the parents, I think would really start to minimize the issues going on within the case study. Thanks. I'm really curious, like one of the dilemmas that um, you you all had set up near the beginning was actually that the school is embedded in this larger contextual setting. And, uh, the, and this question, I think it was Randy who posed it, of who should the school be educating? And is it that the school should just be educating the students? Is that who they're responsible to? Or in fact, are they responsible to educate the community itself, including the parents? Um, and then also, I think Shirley had posed this uh, really clearly at the very beginning, this dilemma around uh, the policy of the politics, right? Like how, how should, should the school be taking a stance on the politics of energy policy, right? Uh, and what stance should the school be taking about its role as, an, a, as a mirror of the community, as a vision of a future community? So one of the things that I thought about is that science is not only taught in her class, science is taught to all the students. So therefore it becomes a collective problem. So therefore, if, if you want to, if, if, if seeing that this is a dilemma and Mrs. Um, Ms. McGuire being real smart and, 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 and forward thinking, this becomes a conversation for the whole school. So this becomes that place where Randy talks about these small conversations. You got to have them and it takes time because we have to learn how to have to, to speak truth to power. That's been my experience with the schools that I've worked with that you start on the inside and you start bringing the stakeholders into your meetings and then you go outside and then you include the school board and the superintendent and then you also have the data to let them know that sometimes uh you know science sometimes has to it's, it's relevance you have to let them know what it is and why it's so important and then what happens is the community becomes an agent of change and maybe can survive well, so I think that um, I, I agree with all of that, Shirley. I think it's so important. It also strikes me, though, that the community needs to be having a conversation in a, in a broader way. And, you know, there's this, th this kind of push and pull between local and, you know, federal um, sort of guidance in schools. And when communities lose the ability to articulate their vision for the children that they're raising, I think something really important has been lost. Um, but yet in a town here where you have the fossil fuel industry so much you know, embedded in, in the happenings, that those sort of federal standards also become important so that it's a conversation between the two. I've also watched towns where um, people had very little say in what their kids were learning. And you could see that perhaps, you know, the way that things would be prioritized might've been a little bit different for them given their vision for their children. So this tension I think is really important and it can be generative and I think it can be a source of growth, but it, it, it needs to be a part of democracy and that messy, messy process that, you know, doesn't always get to action by the point we think it should. Yeah, this this all seems right to me. I mean, the community forums and workshops and and uh, how to bring in the right people and the right things to engage around. But I, I just have to add this. I, I think as I was studying this case study, I'm thinking 
a lot of these parents have to know that it's a limited horizon, a limited future for their town being able to rely on the fossil fuel industry. They have to know that on some level. They're probably anxious about it, but it's basically an industry in terminal decline. And any, anybody who's really insides it and, and knows much understands that it's not going to be, it's going to have a limited role in, in our future. So, I mean, I think if you can get past the anxieties, um, people can, maybe you can have some success in engaging people honestly around what they really envision for the future of the community. In general, I think that a lot of the parents probably don't know and are just as nervous as their kids. I'm sure they know that the impending uh, decline of their economy, and I think it's not only just empowering the, the students, but also the parents that they can have a nice, bright future for their community. And I think that starts with the education of the children and the parents and workshops. I, I would definitely agree with you guys with having um, definitely more meetings after the one in the case study and moving forward, not just in the classroom. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, I will totally agree about the wealth of information uh, that we learned from each of you. And also, I'll just say I really appreciate the way in which you modeled what you were calling for, which was to have a thoughtful collective discussion um, together with those who are in the room here, um, but also calling to mind who was not in the room here and whose voices we might have also liked to hear. And so I'll uh, hope that those of you listening to this podcast will also um, add your own voices and invite others' voices in to converse with you as you think about this case, uh, because uh, I hope that one of your takeaways is that as we think about action as teachers, as principals, as parents, as school board members, as members of communities that are politically divided, but having to make collective choices about how we face our futures together, uh, that you will engage with others whose beliefs and values and ways of being in the world, you may not quite understand, that you may disagree with, that you may even be inclined to disparage or reject, but to recognize that if we are going to move forward together, we need to do so together in, a, in an inclusive way that includes listening and learning together. And I really appreciate the ways in which all four of you, Sadie, Tina, Shirley, and Randy, have um, helped model that and helped us do that together. So thank you. Thanks to Dr. Mira Levinson, Sarah O'Brien, and the Ed Ethics team at the Harvard Graduate School of Education for working with us to create this special series. Thanks also to today's panelists, Shirley Edwards, Sadie Sundahl, Randall Curran, and Tina Grotzer. And thank you for watching this episode. You can find separate links to the case video and the discussion video on our website, ethicalschools.org, and on Dr. Levinson's website, justiceinschools.org, where you can also find links to the other cases that Dr. Levinson and her team have created, as well as resources for leading your own discussions about these cases. We welcome your feedback on this series. Email us and follow us on social media at Ethical Schools. This episode was produced by Hoot Owl Media.